I'm here again with William Lang, founder of Downriver Capital. So Billy, how did we get in this economic mess? You know, the problems started actually back in 2000 with the tech stock blow up. And the irony of it is it wasn't actually the paper losses um, dur during that crisis. It was the reaction of the Fed to what happened at that time. They, the Fed lowered rates dramatically and then kept rates very low for an extended period of time. Why are low interest rates a bad thing? Well, they aren't always a bad thing. It, with The issue is, is that when, when rates are low, it really incentivizes business people to take risks. So when, when rates are kept too low for an extended period of time, the problem is, is that there's so much capital out there trying to chase you know, a finite number of resources, it creates inflation. Why didn't the Fed recognize inflation during this period? It's really a couple of reasons. One primary reason, which actually stems from the mid-'80s. Um, back in that time period, the Federal Reserve changed the way that they, how they gauge home prices in the CPI or consumer price inflation, which is how they gauge inflation in the economy. What they did is they changed from using um, home prices, actual what people paid for their houses, to what's called owner's equivalent rent, which is essentially rent. Um, and if you think about the, you know, what happened throughout the 2000 period is, is that home prices were going up astronomically. At the same time, rents were actually flat to down because we were taking a number of should-be renters and bringing them into the housing piece. Now, the reason why inflation seemed tame during that period is because we were looking at rent levels, not actual home prices. Kind of ironic considering 60% of, of families in the United States actually own a home. So to, to not be including the average family's biggest cost um, of, of living really makes no sense. The other piece is, is that the Fed l uses core inflation, rather, they, which core inflation strips out food and energy prices. And you know, we all know in terms of between 2001 and you know, 2007, what food and energy prices did throughout that period. I mean, it wasn't, you know, right before we went into the crisis, crude is at $146 a barrel and uh, gas prices were over $4 a gallon. Um, so the fact that they were stripping out food and energy and using renter equivalent um, explains why the Fed thought inflation was tame when in reality it was anything but tame. So what is going on in the economy now? Well, the economy has bounced tremendously in the last year. Uh, the, the issue, though, is, is that you know, GDP is up you know, somewhere from 3 to 4% on a trailing 12-month basis. Um, but a lion's share of that growth, actually more than the actual growth component, has been driven by artificial stimulus. Um, you have the $700 billion stimulus plan. You have the home buyer tax credits. Um, and then as well, you have the open market activities that the Fed's been doing um, over the last year. And the issue is, is that that may not be sustainable. And if you look at the chart um, that we can bring up, um, you can see that just the Fed alone has increased the money, the monetary base or the money supply by $600 billion in the last year. Although this increase is frightening, um, it really actually understates the, the levity of what, what the governing authorities have done in the last year, because it doesn't look at what the, the GSEs, which the GSEs are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, what they've done. And if you look at the, the Fed with the GSEs, they've bought over $2.5 trillion in mortgage securities in the last 12 months. Isn't all of this inflationary? In previous cycles, um, it, it absolutely would have been inflationary. Um, but if you look at the chart, uh, you can see that the banks just simply aren't lending to individuals and small businesses. And you can see in the chart that actual business lending at commercial banks has absolutely fallen off a cliff in the last year. What does all this mean for the economy and the stock market? Well, we are living in a very bifurcated world right now. I mean, on the one hand, you have all investable asset classes, whether it's equities or commodities um, or even fixed income, essentially at bubble levels. Um, but then you have the other tail of the other city, which is the real economy. And in terms of the real economy, there's absolutely zero inflation. If anything, you can make a case that there's deflation. If you look at you know, what's happened to car prices in the last year, if you look at what's happened to home prices in the last year, or even consumable goods in terms of technology, 
um, products continue, whether it's a flat screen TV or even appliances, um, have become more affordable. So anything that's tied to the real world um, is deflationary. Anything that's an investable asset is absolutely stratospheric. How does this affect your investment strategy? We feel that there really are one of two things that are going to happen, either that investable, the liquid assets we had mentioned, either need to come down to be in line with where the real economy is, or the other side of this is that, you know, the real economy would really have to expand, which, you know, the, in order to justify the, the valuations that the liquid investable assets are at, you, the real economy would probably have to grow at 4 to 5%. Um, over the next couple of years. And we think that that's very improbable given that you have not only the tax credits just recently have expired, but you also are anniversarying um, the stimulus plan. So the fact that you know that all of that stimulus was new last year no longer is going forward because you're going to be anniversarying that, the, the spending that happened over the last 12 months. So in summary, uh, at Downriver, we you know, we're, we're obviously very, very cautious in terms of where investable assets are relative to the real economy and do believe that investable assets are going to come down to converge with what's going on in the real world. Um, so as a result, you know, our clients are, are hedged uh, in terms of we own stuff that makes a tremendous amount of stuff to own where we're at in this period. But in terms of aggregate market risk, we essentially have hedged out all aggregate market risk. Thanks, Billy. Even though this is frightening, at least I can say I've been warned.